is GA Alexander. Uh, so yeah, I'm uh, GA Alexander. I uh, I'm a writer. I'm mostly a writer of comics, although I'm starting to branch out into uh, short stories. And I mostly work in um, horror. Uh, you know, I'm just sort of trying to. You know, probably at some point I'll want to do some other stuff, but right now, uh, you know, horror and kind of like weird literature, uh, kind of in that like Ligotti Lovecraft vein, is kind of where I where I've been. So it's kind of my comfort zone. So I'll, I'll, I'm staying there right now. Yeah. What is uh, you said Ligotti? Yeah. So uh, Thomas Ligotti. Um, he's uh, kind of a kind of a big deal in the um, kind of like underground uh, kind of underground horror world. He's sort of I guess you could probably describe him as the modern Lovecraft, although he's a lot less like, I don't know, Lovecraft is very like, uh, obviously, you know, everybody knows Lovecraft's bad stuff, but uh, yeah. he's also like a very much a, uh, a fancy man and a very much a, very much a, a kind of a product of uh, wealth, uh, even though he himself was not particularly rich. Whereas like Thomas Ligotti, all of his stuff is like, the same kind of things, but happening in gas stations and beyond. I'm sorry, you're going to see my cat. <laughs> All good, yeah. <laughs> but like, uh, yeah, wonder, like so things like that, but happening in gas stations or like um, kind of dying cities or like you know in warehouses and things like that. So he's sort of like the, the I don't know, but maybe like the blue collar or like the working man's Lovecraft. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds awesome. Um, see, I. I know of Lovecraft, you know, because he's become so popular, especially recently, you know, but obviously there's some controversy around him, him himself, but, uh, yeah. you know, I guess since, what is it, I guess it was like public domain whenever he rolled into that, now mm -hmm. everybody's working on some kind of like Lovecraft thing. I've honestly yeah. never read any of his works sp specifically, you know, so yeah. that's kind of how I know him though, is through the, uh, I guess like the zeitgeist, you know, people are going crazy for it all right now. Yeah, and that's cause sort of the thing. And I don't know, are you, um, have you, have you ever read, uh, like Alan Moore's Providence or any of his like Lovecraft inspired stuff? No, not really. No, uh, not, so, not like, that I have any like specific, uh, aversion to, um, like horror and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and actually I, I find horror comics to be more interesting than like horror movies, you know? Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just never been a genre I've really dove straight into um i can tell you though i do i really like um colin bunn and a lot of the stuff oh, he yeah, does. Yeah, yeah yeah he does a lot of like horror and like body horror and stuff unearth was really cool um rogue planet that one that that blew my mind yeah. just like towers of meat really and good. stuff like what is going on here yeah uh the, the only reason i brought that up is that um so one of the one of the uh one of the ideas in the book and i guess like uh, you know, anybody who's like watching this who hasn't read Providence yet, turn it off. But um, <laughs> one of the uh, one of the kind of the central ideas behind what he uh, was writing in that is that um, like the idea that Lovecraft was, uh, and this is you know, this is just like a part of the story that Lovecraft was uh, like a weird prophet of the horrors oncoming in like the twenty first and twenty second centuries, and um, and like the idea of like all of his ideas suddenly becoming public domain and there being like plushy Cthulhu's and like all these, like, you know, all of his stuff becoming cute and becoming part of popular culture is part of, you know, part of the way that all these horrors from the beyond are actually seeping into our imaginations. So I always thought that was kind of a, a cool idea, especially considering like all of these things that are supposed to be, you know, nightmarish monsters becoming, you know, you know, Plush toys that you can buy as yeah. gifts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That uh, it kind of reminds me of like um, I don't know if you've been reading. Uh, oh man, Tinian's uh, his conspiracy theory book, Department of Truth. I've not read that. No, no, no. Like the the whole thing there is like uh, you know the Department of Truth. They're kind of like monitoring these conspiracy theories because within that that story, you know, is like the more people that believe a conspiracy theory, then like the more real it becomes, you know? So yeah. although it might be a conspiracy that we landed on the moon and it was all framed, if, you know, a majority of people start to believe that, then that actually does become the truth, you know? 
Yeah. And uh, so that's kind of what that sounds like. Like the more that people believe in Lovecraft and stuff and all of his things, like the more that it would like seep into reality, you know? Yeah, that's similar. I guess like, th there's sort of like the, those sort of like social theories about the way that people's brains work that like we kind of accept a lot of things as being, you know, as, as being true, whether or not they, they are. There's a whole idea of like, I don't know, like, lemmings they, they you know they will follow each other off of a cliff or whatever you know and that's yeah. that was made up <laughs> um, but it, you know it was made up in such a way that we've just kind of accepted it as fact um, i like to throw like a thing out there uh, sometimes when people are asking uh so like one, one of the things that really interests me tends to be like uh, the our perception of like you know how does magic work and like how does like uh so like one one of the things that I love always love to throw out there is um, so a penny like a, a U.S. penny um, that is worth one cent right? So, but the the ingredients that take to make a penny are about two cents and two point like fifty three cents. Yeah. But we accept that the penny is worth a cent, mm -hmm. but it's actually worth two. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, and meanwhile, like some of our other currency like the value is actually less than that you know and yeah. we just we just accept the number that's printed on that right you yeah. know yeah because i mean all the, these things are promissory notes at, at the end of the day but i mean and that's kind of what a lot of our beliefs and our ideas are like they're promissory notes they're promising us like these these concepts at some, you know, at some point in the future, these concepts might be completely disproven. They might be, mm -hmm. you know, and, and things like that have happened over the course of history. And it's just, um, we're kind of accepting these either on the authority of the our best, you know, uh, you know, our, our best guesses or the, uh, or the sort of like uh, the best knowledge from the experts that we trust, or in certain cases, just like. Well, I heard a thing from a guy, and I heard he heard a thing from a guy, and yeah, you know, he heard a thing it's from like a lady. That, uh, like, like all these people are just like you know, we just we it's carry like a these collective conscience. Over. Yeah, yeah, like you said, the zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think about that all the time. Like I'll be driving down the road, and I'm like, you know, we built this. There's <laughs> there's literally no reason that every car on this road should all be driving the same way, other than we said so. You know, yeah. but but there's no reason ever people could just drive wherever they want, you know, I mean, have, like, legal have some stuff but... to say about that. But... <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, but, it, but at the end of the day, like all of our society is a construct we've created. Like we have all, you know, have this collective conscience of like, these are the rules we're going to follow, you know? And if you go against those that get you into trouble, you know, but it only exists because we chose it. And, you know, in the past or in the future, that could all change, you know, it, it, the rules could all be different because, we get new information or, you know, something changes or society falls and people are just like, well, who cares what way we drive now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, you think yeah. about like the, the pioneers and stuff, they're traveling across the land. There's no fences. There's no roads. Like they were, they were just like, I'm gonna go that way until I run out of stuff to go to, you know? So sure. yeah, it's really interesting that like, we've all kind of like subconsciously agreed to all of these rules and the idea that if we could believe whatever we could believe, you know, could become the truth because that's kind of how we, we fabricate things, you know? Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's kind of, I mean, on one hand, you know, on one hand, um, some of these, some of these things that we kind of accept for ourselves, uh, they're, they are in our best interests. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, you know, I, I, as, as much as I kind of, um, as much as I am sympathetic to uh, the idea of like, uh, you know, maybe we should be questioning some of these things. On the other hand, like some are in our best interest. We should be mm -hmm. wearing masks right now. We should be, oh, yeah. you know, you know, we should be, uh, you know, we should be driving on the right side of the road, or at least <laughs> yeah. we should be driving on the side of the road as the rest of the traffic. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, these are, uh, you know, some of them are uh, some of the things that we, we, we follow our common sense and some of them are, some of them make sense to question. So it's, yeah. just, I guess like the idea is just trying to figure out which, which from which, uh, mm -hmm. and that's, you know, uh, sometimes that can be really easy and some kind of, sometimes it cannot be really easy. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I think about that all the time. Like, you know, we, we, we kind of should question everything, 
but yeah. only to a certain extent. You shouldn't say like, well, I don't know if we should be driving on the other side of the road and flip it around on your own, you know, but I think you do <laughs> have to have a level of skepticism in order to keep things in check, you know, if, yeah. if you stop thinking about, you know, if you stop questioning things at a certain point, like it does devolve into chaos, you know, so... Yeah, I mean, so the questioning is good. Uh, the questioning is great. I mean, I, I, I um, but to the, the certain extent where you're, uh, if you're, you know, screwing up somebody else's life with, you know, try to tr try. Questioning is great. Being a contrarian uh, tends to be where yeah. the problem comes in. <laughs> there you go. That's, That's like, I'm, I'm just yeah. not going to do the thing that, that they, they tell me <laughs> yeah. to do. It's yeah. Like, well, they also, you know, they, they they tell you not to pee in public, and they tell you not to, uh, and, and they 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 tell you not to drink bleach. So yeah. Maybe don't do this. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. One thing I heard recently, uh, I think it was it was a podcast somewhere, but they were talking about like these unknown truths, you know, things that we know but we don't know why we know them, you know. Yeah. And what what they were kind of touching on there was, um, you know, like in the Bible, you know, they didn't know about. Uh, bacteria and microbes and stuff, you know, but they knew like, you don't want to defecate where you live, you know, because that's going to cause a bunch of problems. It wasn't until, you know, thousands of years later that we understood bacteria and microbes and, and what the actual reason for that was. But, you know, there is a certain sense of like, we have to observe and understand and accept things, you know, that we, we know we can prove, but we don't really know why we can prove it sometimes, you know? Yeah. And I think in a lot of those, like, um, in older societies, when there was less, uh, less uh, sort of like scientific knowledge and less, co especially less codified scientific knowledge, I think that, uh, you know, older, uh, older civilizations, I think we'd be amazed by what they actually, what they actually did understand. And just in a lot of them, they didn't have written language. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, I think in a lot of those cases, when those things were handed down, they, uh, you know, they observed like, well, you don't defecate where you eat because like that guy died. But yeah. also like, we're just going to tell you don't defecate where you eat. And we're going to give you like a, a nice parable about, with a story mm -hmm. that we can tell you about like not doing that. Yeah. <laughs> um, whereas like, you know, yes, nowadays we kind of understand bacteria and we understand the, uh, you know, we understand like bacteria botulism and all these things, like how, you know, how they can wreck our nervous system and our, uh, and our, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the way that our bodies work. Yeah. Um, yeah. We definitely, I think back in the day, um, I mean, that's, that's where storytelling came from. Like it's like we're, we're trying to not only entertain ourselves, but we're trying to instruct ourselves, but and try, we're not trying to like preach to ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. It was also a great way to, um, you know, to pass on like history and stuff and, and remember it because a lot of times you don't remember facts, you know, you don't remember numbers, but when you put it in this story, it's much easier to memorize, you know, there's a certain flow to it. And I think that was a big part of it too, is like, I've seen people die after we've seen people defecate. So like we need a story yeah. that helps us remember these facts instead of just being like, well, I know John and this guy and this guy and this guy all died, you know, so just don't do it. You know, yeah. down the road, you're going to forget those people or no longer does it connect because the person you're telling that to doesn't know those people, you know? So instead you put it in a story and that way it's easy to remember and recite, you know? Yeah. I mean, in that way, um, the details can always change, but the point remains the same. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the, one of the most fun things that I ever, uh, I ever read was, uh, so somebody had like a theory about why all the Mad Max films look different. Like, you know, the, you know, the road warrior and Mad Max and you know, Thunderdome and the new, you know, the new one Fury road. Mm -hmm. Why do they all kind of not look the same? Why does, you know, why, why, you know, why, why did it start off with like, a decaying society and then uh you know the next movie suddenly they're in like post-apocalypse and yeah things like that and the idea that like maybe being like all these different stories about this character of max being told by different people and just over the years it getting weirder and crazier and things like that but always like this character of max being um mm -hmm. uh, you know mad max being the um being the hero of it and the sort of the idea of him um Almost like uh, it's a title or a mantle to be passed instead of, uh, you know, this specific guy, you yeah. know? Yeah. And I, I kind of like that idea. There's a, there's a play that I saw a few years back called um, Mr. Burns. 
uh, if you've ever heard. It. So it's called Mr. Burns, a post-electric play. Oh. Uh, so the, there's, there's three parts to it. So there's three acts in this play. The first, so it's uh, basically supposed to be um, electricity stops, like electricity dies for some reason. And, so, and people just basically try to um, figure out how to go on. So the first act of it are a whole bunch of people who have just met each other. They're kind of like sitting out in the woods they're, you know, eating some provisions and they're just like regaling each other, like telling the story of the Simpsons. <laughs> they're yeah. telling the uh, specifically the Simpsons episode, like the Cape Fear episode uh, where um, Sideshow Bob was stalking oh, the okay. Simpsons family and they went out to the like the lake. And it was a parody of like the Cape, uh, the Martin Scorsese remake of Cape Fear. OK. Um, and then. The um, the next the next act is eight years later, and these people uh, from telling each other like the story of you know the story of this television show have now turned this television show into a stage play. So they they travel from time to town to town, they act out the stage play, and they you know they also act out like the commercials in between, and they you know they get things wrong and they change things uh, to kind of fit the idea. The third act is 70 years later. All those people are dead now. But the yeah. story of The Simpsons, the Cape Fear episode, when they traveled, um, has lived on. And now it is this bizarre kind of like Greek theater thing. They have all these articulate masks and all of these like, uh, they, they, they just, you know, it's become, you know, effectively like, you know, uh, you know, the year like 300. Uh, yeah. You know, 300 AD Greek theater, and um, you know all of these like Sideshow Bob has now been replaced because you know, in the the scope of the Simpsons, Sideshow Bob was not the main villain. Mr. Burns had is so all the Simpsons stories, Mr. Burns has to be the villain in it. Yeah, and so like the idea of it, it's just such a cool idea of like you know post apocalyptic you know, these, this sort of like well-loved television show now becomes like the myth of our time. And we use it to like tell stories and mm -hmm. tell all of these different, you know, different ideas. I like, I think that's such a cool thing. Like I, yeah. and I wonder if like the creators of that, I like, ever thought like, do you think like Seinfeld would be taught in a post-apocalypse society with like, would we be, we be talking about like Kramer and all these people? Yeah, right. <laughs> like, would we be telling the story of like the, the, the five bartenders that lived, uh, lived in Philadelphia and how like you shouldn't follow their example. <laughs> right. <laughs> <Things like that. laughs> um, oh, my favorite is uh, whenever Kramer uh, paints the lines on his, his section of uh, freeway. Oh yeah, <laughs> they should they should teach that because there's so many lessons in that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but like that's the great. Idea, though, yeah. But like the idea of like we have these sort of even like now we have all these sort of um, shows and even if they they want to be like Seinfeld or it's all always sunny in Philadelphia like all these things like even if they want to be like a show about nothing ultimately they have a story they have a moral they have a point they have like mm -hmm. a journey and i think it's i think it i think it really works i like yeah. i think that in the context of storytelling still works mm -hmm. yeah i agree i think that is uh i mean what you're saying here is to me that's kind of um in a way that's like what we're getting out of all these reboots and stuff you know like mm -hmm. you take um like watchmen for instance you know like that's a story that was told to reflect a certain time and what was going on. And then, you know, they did the movie and there's plenty of mixed reviews on the movie, but ultimately yeah. I think he was trying to recapture what that story was, but he forgot to like match the time, you know, but mm. then to see HBO be able to take that story and turn it into something that's once again, relevant, you know, and like as much as we all hate the reboot cycle, I think that's what is ultimately interesting about it is how do you update it and how do you bring it forward and match the time period it's in? And, you know, how do those elements change and why do they change, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I guess I'll, like, I'll, I'll throw this out and like, I don't want this to be like, you know, a device of like, I actually didn't really like the HBO uh, show. I feel like I, Okay. I would have loved the HBO Watchmen if it was its own thing <laughs> as like a tag on the end of Watchmen. I feel like it become like you're 
that story made sense on its own. That story I feel doesn't make sense in the context of Watchmen, which was all about like moral ambiguity and how mm -hmm. um, bad people can do good things and how good people can do bad things. I feel that story, like uh, the HBO story is so black and white and not to say that there is no room for black and white storytelling. I feel like there's a lot of room for that, especially right now. I just feel like you don't it doesn't it didn't really make sense in the context of that. But yeah. I mean as as far as as far as it goes on its on its own, taken on its own without being part of like that Ellen Moore Watchman thing, I think it was a really you know, a really, really solid um a really, really solid show. Yeah. Uh definitely definitely a, a damn sight better than the movie, um, which I liked visually, but I didn't really think they, I agree with you. I don't think they really, I don't think they like, they nailed the storytelling. I didn't, I don't think they, they picked the right things to keep and the right things to drop. Yeah. Yeah. I only watched uh, the first two episodes of the HBO one. So I, I really can't speak to that, but I know what you mean. Like, it's very much like these are the good guys and these are the bad guys, at least within the first two episodes there, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah whereas, a, it doesn't I, change I think it's much, really, basically. Yeah. 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 I think it's really interesting because, um, you know, Alan Moore and, and like the original Watchmen stuff, like that was an era. Like, like, I believe the reason we're so obsessed with the gray area in things now is because we have more information um, in a time where your only access to like your heroes and like people, you know, in general was whatever you got from the media itself or whatever, yeah. they could always be the good guy, you know? And so we would believe in like these big heroes. And then especially with social media, like we see our heroes fall every day when they make a bad tweet or something, we're like, Oh, so he's not quite so perfect. And so yeah. I think that's why like the, the, the modern era of storytelling focuses a lot more on that gray area because we're very interested in like, I don't want to say like tearing down our heroes, but understanding that they're just humans too, you know? And now we, we have that look into their life beyond just when we see them on the screen or whatever else, you know? And yeah. so I think that makes it really interesting that the original Watchmen and everything actually did a good job of portraying something that's so relevant to now during a time period where you still didn't have that much access to people, you know? Yeah. And I think that was, I mean, I think that was the Reagan era, right? Which is honestly like, that was so like rah, rah heroes, which yeah. I think, um, yeah. And I think that that's probably why, why it resonates so much now and why it sort of carried through because it was so um, that, you know, Watchmen and also like things like, you know, Frank Miller's Daredevil, uh, obviously like Dark Knight Returns, things like that were mm -hmm. quite as much as everybody likes to say, like the eighties and comics was a grim and gritty era. It sort of wasn't. It was grim and gritty didn't really come about until like the nineties. Like, um, you know, the the mid to late eighties seems to be where a lot of it um, originated from. But mm -hmm. that was so against the grain. You you had so many like, and like I I mean I freaking love like Marv Wolfman era like um, Teen Titans stuff like that. But like aside from your occasional like. Um, uh, aside from the, your, you know, his occasional like dip into like, you know, Deathstroke, you know, turning terror against the Teen Titans and stuff like that. Yeah. Just like that, that model of storytelling um, was not particularly nuanced. Um, mm -hmm. and, it, and when he, when he did dip into that nuance, that was why, that's why those storylines became so like classic is because if, you know, here's a guy who was doing, you know, paint by number. I don't know. I don't want to say paint by number. It's like that's that's a bad way of putting it, but kind of like your standard like hero stuff, and then he kind of one eighty on everybody, and yeah, that's you know that's why Mark Wolfman is always going to be remembered as a, a you know great creator, and that's all that's why um, and that's why you know Alan Moore is going to be, and why Frank Miller, you know, despite all of the things that people <laughs> say about Frank Miller, yeah. he did something so different in a time where mm -hmm. everything was so the same that um, you know. People have been kind of like trying to copy off of that mold for so long. And, um, you know, kind of with Frank Miller, um, they've kind of gotten the closest to it. Like they've been trying to, you know, they've been kind of like recycling his ideas for so long. Yeah. But he's, yeah, I think, I mean, those creators of that time and that uh, you can kind of like, I mean, there's so many others of that, that as well, uh, you know, as, 
you know, and Ascenti uh, throws so, through so many cool ideas into the X-Men universe. Uh, there are people, uh, you know, uh, Louise Simonson is like such like an under, you know, uh, underappreciated creator from that time. Like they are all working in these shades of gray that were not the t- not the thing of the mm-hmm. of the era that they yep. they created the next one. They just created out of whole cloth. It was it's really really cool to kind of look back and see it. Yeah. Yeah, I've uh, long believed that um, they were kind of ahead of their time right there, like in the yeah. like late 80s, because in the 70s, you had a lot of the like counterculture and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then at the beginning of the 80s, Reagan comes into office and he changed a lot of regulation. And suddenly the stock market became th- those guys became celebrities overnight. And with yeah. that, you saw like movies and entertainment the music industry completely sold out. Like it was so corporate at that point. And that was kind of everything was just like this big corporate thing. And then you had like the dark Knight returns and stuff coming right at the end of the eighties there that were like, instead of portraying everybody as like this big corporate hero, we're either Mm going to take these heroes and make them the bad guys, or we're going to really observe their relationship to their bad guys and yeah. then once you get into the 90s, you see like music revolted and kind of followed that same channel, you know. And so I really I do believe that like 80s, especially like late 80s comics was the precursor to what all the mainstream for music and movies and TV became in the 90s. You know, yeah. it was almost yeah. like they were one step ahead of them, you know. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, uh, yeah, to a certain point, like, uh, you know, you, you kind of get to that thing where. Um, you know, you, you spend, you know, you know, spend five, six years creating a counter- counterculture and then everyone else spends the next 10 years kind of making money off of the counterculture. Yeah. <laughs> um, the counter counterculture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's thing. Like, like they sell your rebellion back to you. Uh, mm-hmm. So yeah, a lot of nineties became dark for the sake of dark. Well, you know, mm-hmm. I love a lot of stuff from the nineties. Uh, the crow is, you know, probably oh, yeah, like yeah. the first, <laughs> the first comic book that like, grabbed me um mm-hmm. and then I, i'm now like going back and I'm kind of rediscovering all these sort of like weird indie comics from the 90s i'm I, like i sort of st- really started getting into the one called faust um to the point where like i when i still lived in the states i was like trying like i was driving around to like every comic shop in like a three hour radius of me trying to find like old back issues and then i started just buying them off off of ebay but it's um this dude called um, uh, Tim Vigil, uh, and I cannot remember the writer, and that's weird for me because it's usually the other way around, which is usually my my soft spot. Um, but it's he has this drawing style, which is uh, it's like uh, Bernie Wrightson, except Bernie Wrightson um, gone completely off his rocker. Like he he has this like beautiful line art, um, and he will just draw the most horrifying offensive <laughs> um you know uh, you know violent pornographic uh nightmarish things uh, and he's uh, tim vigil is just like he's an amazing artist i like I, I just lose myself like reading like reading his stuff just yeah uh but like that and just uh i i i uh, love a dude called uh, ted nafee who is Back in the day, he did a comic called Gloom Cucky, which, uh, which was uh, uh, kind of like one of the early goth comics along with like Johnny the Hobbit, oh. Maniac and all that. Oh, and yeah. He, okay. He has this just kind of amazing, like it seems like a precursor to like the modern Marvel era stuff where it's sort of, it's sort of, it's sort of superhero-y, but it kind of looks animated and it like, and he was doing that like 20 years before anybody else. Wow. It's amazing to look at. Yeah, it's a Ted Nafee. Uh, if anybody is watching this, definitely check his stuff out. He is now doing a lot of uh, fantasy uh, work. But yeah, he's just amazing. He's an amazing guy. Do you know of um, crap. Valiant Comics? They have, mm-hmm. uh, what is it? Woody and... Uh... Oh, Quantum and Woody, Woody, Quantum and Woody with uh, yeah, Christopher Priest that, writing. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of like that, right? Priest. Like, yeah. it's superhero, but it's like this very like animated, weird, weird mix mm-hmm. of like almost like animated, but it's also superheroes and like it's grounded, but they have a goat. So like, you know, it reminds me of like Deadpool, but 
um, much more nuanced, you know, yeah. like Deadpool's yeah. like, I'm going to break the fourth wall and make these jokes. And they're like, we're going to break the fourth wall, but like, we're not going to be so over the top and like, we're going to be grounded, but not really ground, you know? And yeah. that's, that's yeah. really interesting stuff to me wherever they can blend all of that. Yeah. Actually, uh, the writer of Quantum and Woody, Christopher Priest or Jim Owsley, I think it, as he was called at the time, wrote one of my favorite arcs on Deadpool back in the day where he oh, really? basically, he basically took Deadpool and turned it into um, a sitcom of uh, super <laughs> villains living in an apartment together. And so like you had like, uh, God, I, I, I can't remember if it was, um, it was like, uh, I think it was like, Cottonmouth or somebody. It was like Deadpool. It was like calling Cottonmouth and like yelling at him to get like, tell me who sent me mail this week. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm on a mission. Oh my god, that, that, that makes me think of uh, uh, oh man, what's it? Uh, the Killers movie with Woody Harrelson. Oh, uh, mm. Natural Born Killers. Natural Born Killers, Natural right? Born killers. Whatever, yeah, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Like uh, they find out. Yeah, whatever they find out her uh, her backstory and stuff, and it's like an old like '50s sitcom and stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like the way that it's just like over the top, but like it still fits within the context of all that craziness, you know. That's yeah, why I think yeah. of wherever I think of like Deadpool with like villains in a sitcom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, God, yeah. I've always I've always kind of wondered when. Um, if any of the Deadpool writers uh, were ever influenced by, uh, I don't know if you remember this cartoon, Freakazoid. Uh, it was one of the like, yeah, Animaniacs, yeah. Like, Adventures, uh, yeah, era of mm -hmm. cartoons. But yeah, that's, because, like, that's about the era I grew up on. On as far as like Saturday morning cartoons and stuff. Yeah, yeah I, I was wondering if they ever, um, if that was ever an influence for anybody, because I know that that cartoon was influenced by Mike Allred's Madman. Uh, which is a comic book from the nineties as well. So yeah. kind of like, but that, because I, I, you know, obviously like Deadpool early on was really dark. <laughs> like, you know, the, the, you kind of like realize early on that like, Oh, this is, you know, in Deadpool's head, he's, he's a character from a comic book in everyone else's perspective. Deadpool is an insane person with a healing factor who believes he's a person from a yes. <laughs> but like I, I always wondered if um it, when it went because uh, like Deadpool got a lot more slapstick and a lot more funny as it went. Mm -hmm. I always wonder if like that that was ever an influence for anybody. You know. Yeah, that's a great question. I've never really even I don't know. I've never even connected Freakazoid and Deadpool, but that totally makes sense because. Yeah. He like unfortunately we are kind of living that reality at the moment, <laughs> but you know the the just the concept of like somebody believes something so much, like so purely in their head that they are acting on the real physical world based on that perception. You know, like yeah. that's crazy. That's insane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think that's how uh, when Rick Remender was doing X Force, I think that's how he kind of uh, he wrote Deadpool. Is just like he. he Deadpool is a person who thinks he's a comic in a comic book. He's not a guy in a comic book, which a lot of people just write Deadpool as like he's you know Bugs mm -hmm. Bunny. He's a guy who thinks he's Bugs Bunny, and that's really dangerous because he has a lot of guns. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, you you look at like uh, you know if the way they do him now, especially like in the movie and stuff, like he very much comes off as like a guy in a comic book where like he can do anything because he won't die, you know, but. Yeah the very idea that no, he's in the real world. Like that's what makes him like interesting and uh, different and fun, you know, is because you know that he's affecting people's lives. Whereas yeah. if he's a guy in a comic book, well now he's only affecting other comic book characters, you know, like you said, like Bugs Bunny can drop the anvil on their head a million times. They're not going to die because they're other characters in that world. But when you yeah. put Bugs Bunny in the real world dropping an anvil on somebody's head, well, that has repercussions, you know? And that's yeah. when it really gets interesting because, like, how do you control somebody like Deadpool that has these powers, but he's completely out of his mind, you know? Like, how do you stop that? That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's uh, definitely a... Uh... 
I don't know. I, if, if that's not a thing they've kind of approached recently, I think it's a thing that probably, pro probably deserves some, uh, d deserves some writer to, uh, uh, kind of look into it as the real world, uh, the, the real world, um, repercussions of a dead pool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's an interesting concept there because, uh, like, uh, Chappelle show, you know, they had the, the real world and they had, it's like all like regular people, like they would be in MTV's the real world. Mm. And then you had like yeah. the one rapper, he's like, yeah. dialogue, 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 <laughs> you know, like yeah. that guy was great. Like, what if you had a series where it was a cast of real people, but in a reality show with Deadpool, you know, living in a house or something that, that yeah. could get really interesting, you know, like how, how do yeah, they directly sure. interact with him? <laughs> yeah, that could be, that could be really interesting. I think, uh, yeah, that's, uh. Leaving money on the table, Marl. Money on the table. <laughs> yeah, I haven't read the most recent stuff. I just heard they have. He has like a giant pet shark or something now and stuff. And yeah, seems about right. like, yeah, yeah, it sounds about right. But uh, it also sounds again like he's a comic book character in a comic book world. Whereas it's always more interesting to have him in the real world. You know, I guess yeah. they kind of got close to that in the uh, in Deadpool two. Whenever he has like the whole. The whole crew you know and they all like yeah, die they immediately die. <laughs> <laughs> like that's about as close as they get to that in the movie but it's yeah, interesting I, I really appreciated uh hiring brad pitt to just drop it <laughs> <laughs> as an invisible guy yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh that was so good I remember yeah. uh, my friend went and saw it like the first day it came out. He's like, dude, did you know Brad Pitt's in the movie? And I was like, I had no clue. Like, really? <laughs> he's like, yeah. And then I went and saw it like two days after it was out or something. I was like, oh, I, that, that's a great setup because like I'm looking through this whole movie, like waiting for Brad Pitt to show up. And then it's like flashes on the screen. I was like, oh, I see what yeah. they did there. <laughs> they sold me on a whole movie because of one actor. <laughs> So I I feel bad that they uh, I I mean I I guess now that uh, now that uh, Disney's bought back the uh, or re received back the rights to uh, the X Men stuff they, they can undo this but I feel I felt bad that they kind of kind of like wasted um, Zeitgeist uh, and especially like Bill Skarsgård as Zeitgeist. Because um, the story, the the book he was from, Ecstatics, is one of my favorite, like Marvel, mm -hmm. like especially early two thousands books. Um, it came out kind of around the same time as like the Grant Morrison New X Men stuff, and it kind of had like it was really cool in the idea of it being like, what if, um, what if, uh, what if the X Men, or at least like, what if, what if like X Men esque mutant characters were like mega celebrities and just played with that. Now they've done a little bit with, with like new warriors where they were doing like a reality show thing with them. It's like, but the idea of like playing with like absolute celebrity and actually um, uh, it was written by Peter Milligan. who's was one of my favorite writers too, but the, the, the idea of um, yeah, ecstatic. So ecstatics, you know, it was like, what if these characters were mega celebrities and it was, such like it's such a different book and that's another mike allred uh, drawn book as well he's a phenomenal artist but uh yeah it just he but yeah the bill skarsgård's character uh zeitgeist was from ecstatics and uh, that's just another kind of another thing that people really should check out it's one of those it's like you know like the grant morrison doom patrol thing it's a thing that everyone's kind of like heard of maybe but maybe not everybody's Red. It's never. It's, it's never one of your like perennial. Like you must read this books. But I think it really deserves to be. It's really really cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. Um, I mean, that's kind of the thing. Is like, I don't. We live in this world where sales dictate everything, and uh, you know the the biggest things tend to always break all the rules. You know, and ignore the sales. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, I I think that's really interesting. Is a lot of times what they're adapting into like media, you know, into movies or TV yeah. is the stuff that sold really well in the comics, but nine times out of 10 it sold really well in the comics because it was like an all-star uh, team or, you know, it was like big deal creators or something like that. Whereas if you really talk and like mine, the comic community, there's so many like little bitty books and runs and series that, you know, people would really attach to if they knew they even existed. But 
because they never made those sales back then, they don't see the viability for it in the market now. And yeah. I think that's a big mistake, you know? Yeah, I think a lot of the movies they'll they'll latch onto one concept from those uh, from those runs, and that that'll be all. Like, I think one of like my favorite or what what I don't know, if favorites the best way of putting it, but like one of the the, the best way of describing it is like look at Captain America: Winter Soldier, the movie, and Captain America: The Winter Soldier, the comic book. Aside from the fact that Bucky's back and he's the Winter Soldier, these things have nothing to do with each other. <laughs> like you, you, like you, you didn't get any of uh, any of the Russian stuff. You didn't get. Uh, you barely got any like Armzola. You got you know just all of like the political intrigue of the comic book. There was political intrigue in the movie, but uh, it was very, very, uh, very, very sort of lax. And I think like. They really like they stepped it up in the the sequel to it, the the Civil War stuff, like quite a mm -hmm. bit. But I feel like the they really dropped the ball with like pulling. They had the opportunity to pull a lot of like very cool ideas from that book, and it just didn't. I guess it didn't fit in the idea of the grander Marvel Cinema Universe. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, you seem to have a pretty like uh, deep knowledge of like Marvel and the X Men and stuff. What do you think about the MCU and what they're going to be able to do now that they have those those rights back? What do you think that's going to turn into? Um, probably, uh, I'm not a big MCU fan, unfortunately, especially like right now. I just kind of, I, I'm done with origin stories. Uh, I mean, in my general opinion, I would like to see a lot more stuff like what they were doing with DC for a second, where you had more standalone stories with the characters. I I generally like the idea of there being a larger cinematic universe you can pull ideas from, but I'm more, I feel like more, the way Marvel does it, it is in, in deference to the larger universe. And I feel like the larger universe should be more in deference to the, uh, to the individual stories. So I would have liked to see a, a Doctor Strange movie be less uh, less of a setup for the third Thor movie and just stuff like that. I think I'm probably, like, I'm taking a break from a lot of those movies for a while until, you know, something really, really piques my interest. I don't know. I, I feel, you know, the, I mean, the Netflix show is pretty good. I agree with you good. 100%. Like, I'm the same way. Like, I'm tired of origin stories I like what um, I do like what DC was thinking. Their execution was just really bad. But, yeah, but on, on some, on some, yes, and some, no. Well, yeah, I, I mean, it, it was hit and miss. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, like Aquaman did. Uh, Aquaman was a pretty fun movie. I thought Shazam was really, really good for what it was. Yeah, uh, I, re was I really, I really like the Joker movie. Although I thought that. I felt that everybody cared too much about it. <laughs> like it was a fun, it, it was a fun movie. It was a thought provoking movie. Mm -hmm. It wasn't worth all those online fights you had about it. Yeah, um, but uh, yeah, and I feel well, like. What do a you lot think of, about a sequel on that? I'd be interested in if they did another Joker movie with the same cast in a different time frame with no connection to the the first one. Have you know, have, you know, Joaquin Phoenix be the Joker and have like all these, all the actors, at least all the actors you can afford to get back, be in this movie in different roles. Just have it be a different Joker story and have it be, you know, that one was the seventies, maybe do the eighties, then do the nineties and just do completely different stories every time, just with like somebody either being or becoming the Joker. I think that, yeah. that would be a cool way of doing it. Um, and have it be, yeah, I mean, have it be like social commentary every time of like the social issues of the era. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like yeah. that. That's probably the best take on it I've heard. I know I, I was opposed to the idea of a sequel. I still kind of am, but I do like your idea. But my whole thing is like part of what made that movie so powerful and so thought provoking is it said, we're going to pick this story up here and it's going to end here. Um, yeah. and this idea that there should be a sequel to that, I'm like, no, because that's kind of going to take away a lot of what was so thought provoking about it. Like you don't need, I know the human mind is engineered for, uh, completion, you know, like we want everything to finish, yeah. but I don't, I, I like the way that that just kind of like drops into this guy's life and we leave this guy's life, you know? 
and um, right. everybody wants a sequel. And I'm like, but what you know? What if it kind of messes up everything that was so? Th they're they're going to be searching for the answers that they wanted in the first one, and then people yeah. are like, oh, but you know, if it's not any good, then you can just pretend. Well, no. Once I've seen it, like I know that that's part of it. It's going to really ruin it for me personally, you know. But you know, I think the movie that really like set my mind on fire in that way was uh, Inside Lewin Davis. And okay. I mean, yeah. that, that movie had like very, very loose structure and stuff. And it was, but it was, it was like here, we're going to just like pick up in this guy's life on this day and it's going to end on this day. And like, that's what you get. But I, I'm still thinking about that movie to this day. Like just everything that happens, like because you get no answers, your mind is always trying to complete it, but you don't have the complete, piece you know and to yeah. me that's more interesting than if they do uh, a joker sequel and they try to like answer all those questions from the first one but yeah. like doing it as like an anthology piece like that that's really interesting like addressing the different social uh issues across different eras that could be a really good idea there yeah and i think like the first the first one did uh you know did the sort of uh this kind of address the separation between uh you know the uh, rich and poor and the sort of uh, the, the, you know, they had the whole thing of, you know, the garbage strikes and how uh, people in, you know, people in New York in that movie were, uh, you know, were kind of like left behind by, uh, you know, while other people kind of in, enjoyed all the wealth, you know, the, if they did an eighties one, they could do like, they could do it like a Reaganomics, like mm -hmm. uh, take where, um, what happens when there is just like such this like weird artificial in, you know, influx of money into the system and how does that affect people's lives and things like that. And then, you know, in the nineties the one, they could do, uh, you know, the, 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 the sort of like a minor bust that happened in the nineties. Maybe they could do like political intrigue and things like uh, what was mm -hmm. happening. You know, uh, Clinton and the Lewinsky stuff, or they could do, you know, or they could do, uh, you know, something related to, you know, everybody's eyes being on Kosovo and not on like, not on like local issues and things like that. Yeah. You know, there's so much like you can mine from that. And there's so much from these eras that mm -hmm. is relevant to what we're going through today that I feel like just saying like 70s Joker, but again, might be not be the way to do it. No. Yeah, I really like how they just like kind of left it there and you can be like, okay, so like, you know, we can imagine what what happened with that and nobody has the answer or not. And uh, to go into like the 80s and do, you know, Reaganomics and the impact that all that deregulation had on society, yeah. you know, uh, yeah, there's absolutely. a whole generation of us that grew up on Saturday morning cartoons that were written as just 30 minute commercials, you know, that didn't yeah. happen before us. And it, it's dropped off a lot since. But that was a direct effect of uh, Reagan, you know, deregulating the cartoon industry, you know, yeah, and, yeah. you know, and then you go into the nineties and you had the internet blowing up and the dot com. Like these are really interesting social issues to, to look at because even if you're looking at like the dot com boom and bust, you know, like how does that compare to what social media companies are going through right now? Like, you know, Facebook yeah. and Twitter are going to, having to go sit in front of uh, Congress and explain themselves just like uh, Microsoft and Apple were doing in the nineties. And most people don't even know that that happened, you know, yeah. like those are interesting issues to highlight with that kind of stuff. Yeah. And that nineties sort of like dot com, like internet growth thing that that's basically what a lot of the inf inspiration for uh, the book that I'm about to kickstart obsolete uh, is about, do you like the segue by the way? That's a good segue. <laughs> that was awesome. Man. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'm, I'm currently writing uh, or I've written uh, the first issue uh, and I've kind of plotted out the rest of it. Um, so uh, we're launching a Kickstarter. Uh, we're recording this on, for me, Friday night, I think for you, Friday afternoon. Uh, yeah. Actually, technically for me, it's Saturday morning. Uh, <laughs> we're going to be launching it on uh, launching it on Saturday. Um, so the concept basically is, um, or at least the, the concept for the larger world of the story is what would, ha what would have happened if in the mid-90s there was a huge hack attack uh, at the, one of the highest levels of government and the U.S. government basically made a rule saying, all right, this happened because we have net all this network technology is just starting up. We put all of our stuff online. We got attacked. No more networks. 
no more networked computers, no more, no more networked phones. The only people who are allowed to have networks are uh, mil uh, the military. Uh, and then we'll get into um, some exceptions that happen um, throughout the book. Um, and it's basically what happens in, you know, not now, but 2060 in a, wor in a world, or at least in America, uh, that does, has never had uh, network technology. So everything is sort of hypercharged versions of what was there in the 80s and 90s. Uh, we have, um, you know, instead of, instead, you know, instead of uh, streaming everything, we have, you know, you know, crazy versions of like zip drives and, you know, SCSI ports and uh, all of our stuff is kind of based off of, you know, all of our cameras are, are now based off of, um, you know, kind of variations on previous technologies rather than new technologies we've mm -hmm. developed to kind of fit, fit in with the, uh, the new world. Um, there's been less space travel, so there's been uh, less, you know, space travel kind of dr drives a lot of American, um, you know, technological mm -hmm. um, creation. So, you know, there's yeah. less, there's just so much less uh, there. And so uh, it takes place in a city, in an unnamed city in America, which is kind of turned into one of those like Judge Dredd mega cities. It's, you know, everything is districted and out, everything is overbuilt. Uh, but every district has kind of has its own flavor. There's, you know, District 1 and District 2 that are like your kind of like richer and more um, well-to-do areas. And then you have like your, you know, you know your more you know, blue collar areas. And then you have your sort of like warehouse, like industrial areas. And we kind of look into uh, the first issue, at least, looks into um, one of those uh, kind of like less well-to-do, more blue-collar areas with two bartenders who are just trying to uh, get through their lives, slinging drinks to uh, to uh, people down on their luck. Um, and as they're you know as they're going through their days and uh, throughout their nights, strange things start happening um, because we don't have a lot of the techno technological things that you know in the real world we enjoy. Um, a lot of these new, uh, a lot of these technologies we've developed have been kind of like building up power needs. So okay. the city's power grid is now kind of falling apart. To uh, and to fix that, uh, the government does not, in fact, replace the power grid. They just decide, all right, we're going to have rolling blackouts. <laughs> Um, I was kind of inspired. I, I, there's uh, there's a couple of countries that I read about who have uh, ruling blackouts as part of their mm -hmm. uh, as, as, as part of their I guess like their solution uh, to a their, problem. Yeah, yeah. So it kind of uh, that inspired me. But uh, so we're gonna have rolling blackouts, and then something else happens. Uh, there are um, because of uh, because of these rules from the government military organizations were still able to have network technologies and they've been going buck wild with uh you know trying to develop different things so um some of the things that they've developed you know um they started trying to uh experiment on um yeah, experiment on human beings experiment on um on soldiers and uh try to uh you know and um try to come up with new ways to make soldiers be more effective in the field like and enhance them. Enhance them. Um, it went horribly wrong. They shut down the projects uh, and they kind of buried, uh, buried all the things that they uh, had created uh, in various warehouses. Something to do with the power going up and down in the city has somehow kicked in uh, and reactivated some of these things. So it's basically two bartenders uh, trying to just try to get through their day and slowly realize that these things that are neither human nor machine are slowly taking over. Okay. They initially show up in shadow. They initially, you know, they they're showing up in you know back alleys or wandering around, but they kind of start noticing there's more and more and more of them. And why is it, why are there more and more and more of them? And why are these things? Why are, you know why why do some of them look like old corpses and some of them look like people I saw yesterday? Uh, so it, it kind of becomes that, and it's uh, so it, it's body horror, it's uh, cyberpunk, it's uh, in general, it's uh, you know it has a lot of sort of like political allegory in it, and it has a mm -hmm. lot of uh, it it. it 
Um, it's it's a it's a thing very close to my heart. Yeah. Um, I think it early... sounds. Uh, I think it sounds really interesting. It's um, there's. I don't know if it's even a genre. It's just a trend I've noticed that I've become really obsessed with lately. Um, I believe that we tell stories, especially in the modern age. It's a way to explore like potential possibilities and stuff. And I also think in general as a society, as we feel like, uh, you know, our world is kind of coming to an end in some ways, I think we are at this tipping point where we're starting to think like we need to uh, reimagine the things we already have and the things we already know. And so like there's this anime called Dr. Stone um, and ev basically everybody's like turned into stone and then they wake up like, I think 7,000 years in the future and so they have to like rebuild society, but they know all of like science and stuff. So they're starting basically from the stone age, but they have the knowledge of what society could become, you know? And so it's kind of exploring like, how would we uh, readapt that, you know, and how would we make better choices if we knew where things were going to go instead of like, just kind of like learning as we go, you know? Um, yeah. And then there's this other comic that I backed on Kickstarter he has a little bit of it on webtoon and it's called uh, after the gold rush and it's kind of the same thing like this guy comes back from like you know basically like a colony that's uh you know been away from earth for so long they don't even know anything about earth and he comes back and like people are primitive again but he has like the the, the knowledge of science you know so he meets like a woodsman and he has a cough and so he's like Oh well, look! I can get these mushrooms and this uh, this algae and stuff and grind it up. Here's penicillin, and he heals the guy, you know. And so that's kind of what it sounds like to me. You're talking about here is like this idea that if all the technology went away, and so you're able to explore the idea of like how could we reimagine what that would be now that we know where it goes, you know, versus yeah. learning as we go, you know. It always it always goes in this path. And then we look back and we're like, how did we get here? You know, and this is saying, well, we know where it goes. So let's not go there. You know? Yeah. I mean, for me, it was a lot of like, um, the, the, the sort of like trying to like problem solving, like one of the big problems in horror movies and like horror stories in general, it's like, why don't you just call the police? Uh, <laughs> so like my, my initial thought is like, well, I mean, if, if, if this is going to be a sci horror story, if I'm going to be like playing with these like cyberpunk stuff, like why, why would I want to set it with all the technology of now? What would be different? Like, why would it be different? And like, so I sort of like started like throwing together this, you know, vaguely convoluted alternate history yeah, yeah. Uh, together. But um, I think that that kind of informed uh, so it, it informed a lot of the story and it informed my way of kind of like see, seeing it because like I don't I have not in the past written a lot of work that I would describe as like overtly political mm -hmm. but I think in this in this case this one I mean it is like it's not it's not like political god is that, what is that word like politically didactic like it's not telling people what to think and like I'm not telling people that your cell phone is yeah. evil and you're like or anything like that it's just um, it is, uh, it's, it's not technophobic in any capacity, but it is sort of, it is kind of questioning, it, it, it is at least wanting to, to ask people to question what is your relationship with technology mm -hmm. uh, in, a, not in, a, not in a sense where I'm trying to tell people uh, in any way, shape or form, tell people like, get off of Twitter, get off, of, don't do all these <laughs> yeah. things, go move out into the woods, live in a hut. Like, I yeah. don't want that for people at all mm -hmm. uh, but it is kind of my my thought in 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 writing a lot of that is like what would people's lives be like um and in a lot of cases it wouldn't be that different aside from the fact that you know technology isn't there and um you i don't know it, it people you know people in this world have Diff slightly different connections with each other than they, mm -hmm. they would in our modern world, just because um, we don't have, you know, we don't have a little screen in between each other. Um, yeah. But it's also, um, it, 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 it's also, it also comes in, you know, it comes with a cost. It comes with the cost of not having the ability to call the police when the monster shows mm -hmm. up. It comes with the, 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 the issue of, you know, not having the ability to know what, you know, the guy across town is doing. Like, uh, it, it, you know, all these 
it 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 poses more questions than it answers, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But I feel like maybe that's maybe that's kind of my job as a, a yeah. as, as a writer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that's kind of a thing. I mean, like we were just talking about, you know, like ask the bigger questions, but also don't be afraid to admit that you don't have the answers, you know. But yeah. a lot of times you don't even think of the questions until they're presented, you know, and then it's like, okay, well, let me think about this, you know. Yeah. Like me and my friend, we have conversations all the time where we're like thinking about a problem that's in the world and we're like, okay, well, I see this is the problem. I know this is the problem, but we'll get to a point where we're like, honestly, I don't even know like what my solution is to this, but I'm glad we're having this conversation where we're asking that question, you know, because now I know to go home and think about it, you know, before I didn't even know, hey, I should think about that, you know, and I think yeah. that's what's so great about storytelling is it's asking you to ask questions, you know, be skeptical, but don't be contrarian, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a, I think that's a good, uh, it's like we were saying before, yeah. Um, being skeptical, but not being contrarian, at least like not being contrarian in the way that would hurt other people. And, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I think is honestly, I think that's sort of the way to be. I mean, obviously, you know, I'll, 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 I'll dial it back to like what's happening with, you know, what, what's happening with our current society. Um, mm-hmm. So with, uh, you know, with the current pandemic that's going on, we're running into uh, a lot of people who do not want to wear masks. <laughs> they do not want to wear masks. To a certain extent, I can kind of, I can kind of see an argument against masks just because I have read so much from the WHO and the CDC saying that if you do not have like a four layers of fabric over your face, there is a lot of like, you are, you are so susceptible to a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if there's a chance that like I can wear a mask and not kill somebody, I'm just going to wear the freaking mask. (laughs) Yeah. Like, yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be skeptical, but I'm also not going to be contrarian. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do the thing because it's very possible. Like, you know, I, there's, there's a good possibility that like recycling actually does not, Pro- mm-hmm. does not help the environment in any meaningful way, especially yeah. like in the way that we're doing it, probably mm-hmm. in the, the way that we should be doing it. It absolutely was, but in the way yeah. that we are doing it as a, you know, a worldwide society, mm-hmm. I'm still going to put my bins out for the yeah. recycling because, you know, if there's a chance that I'm not going to kill somebody yeah. with my trash, I'm going to yeah. take that. <laughs> yeah. See, I've seen a lot of reports on that and that's what they talk about. Like we've been trained like basically on this like lazy recycling thing where it's like if you put your pizza box in there recycling because it's cardboard, that should be great. Except for whenever they go to sort the recycling, they're like, well, there's cheese on this cardboard, so we can't recycle it. So they end up having to put it back in the, you know, and so like you were saying, like, it's not that what we're doing isn't better than not doing anything, but it's like so inefficient and the effect is actually so minimal that um, yeah. You know, there's really a much more complicated version of recycling we need to do in order to get to yeah. that like net gain point, you know? Yeah. And there's ways of like recycling, uh, you know, whether it's your local government or the, the individual companies need mm-hmm. to actually be doing recycling that, you know, is generally not done because it's an expensive way of doing it, even though it's mm-hmm. more like environmentally friendly way of doing it. Yeah. And stuff like that. I mean, there's but once again like if there's a chance that like i'm not going to kill the world exactly yeah try not to kill the world like yeah. if it feels like you know at the very least i'm not going like if i'm not even if i'm not going to like save the world like harm reduction feels like an important mm-hmm. goal like uh, it really does yeah i'm the same way like i'm still going to put my stuff in the recycling because i think best case scenario at least a little bit of my things do make it into recycling Worst case scenario, somebody's getting paid to like put that over into the regular trash. And so at least I'm like helping somebody make a dollar, you know, yeah. like, that's, that's the yeah. best I could think of it is like, I'm probably not having a huge effect on society or in the environment, but if I'm doing anything that's, that's worth trying for, you yeah. know? Yeah. So, I mean, that's absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's called obsolete, right? Uh, Obso, so it's four? up yeah Obso slash lead. Uh, okay. so it's uh, cyberpunk horror if you are uh, if you're looking at this uh, basically any point after the 14th of November uh, just type obsolete into Kickstarter it'll take you right there uh, yeah you can also you know down here you'll see my uh, Twitter I will mm-hmm. have uh, 
I'll probably be shilling this for an entire month. So <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, I'm gonna help you out with that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so what about yeah. the uh, creative team? That, that's something else I wanted to ask you about. Because uh, you're writing it, but then you have uh, more people involved too. So uh, yeah. what are they doing? So we have Justin M. Ryan. Uh, so Justin is, uh, he's kind of a jack of all trades. He uh, He's best known for, he wrote a uh, comic book. Uh, I think it came out in like a year, year and a half ago called Trespasser. Uh, it was on, uh, was on Alterna Comics, I believe. Uh, he's oh. a... And he's a he's a phenomenal uh, writer, and uh, he's now like kind of like dipping into like doing line art. So he's now uh, he's penciler and inker for the book, uh, and he's kind of not just been that. He's also been kind of a really good sounding board for like creative ideas and like keeping me. Yeah, uh, I have that like right like bad writer uh, thing of like I'm just gonna write all the dialogue, <laughs> and everybody's gonna talk to each other. And it's gonna be great. It's, He's been really good at getting me to like uh, cut back on a lot of that, mm -hmm. and um, you know, asking me, you know, you know, I, you know, questioning plot holes and things like that. It's, he's mm -hmm. been a phenomenal sounding board and like creative partner for this. So Justin's been kind of been there from uh, kind of uh, from like the second draft of the script. He's just uh, he's been uh, a fantastic, fantastic partner to work with on it. And then we have Todd Rayner who uh, has a. He has his own uh, comic uh, series, like it's self-published generally, but it's uh, distributed through Sierra Nova Comics, who also do some of my uh, my comic book stuff. Um, and it's called Ice Pick. Uh, so Todd Rayner and Justin Ryan are the uh, the two other guys who are uh, helping me out with this. Awesome. Uh, and I'm sorry, what did Todd do? Is he lettering? Uh, colors? I, he's colors, yeah. He's doing okay. colors. Yeah, he's doing a So who does the comic. lettering? Uh, that's going to be me. Um, oh, okay. So it's coming back to you. Yeah. For the time being. So, uh, it's going to be me doing, um, doing, me doing the letters. I've been doing, I've been lettering my own stuff kind of since jump. I, uh, you know, eventually I, you know, I, I kind of fancy myself as an artist, but you know, I, I want to keep trying to get better and I don't feel like I'm like measuring up to myself. So that's <laughs> why I'm so lucky to work with fellows mm -hmm. like this, but yeah, so I'm lettering, uh, lettering it, and then on um, the covers, we're gonna have Justin's gonna be doing one cover. Uh, we're gonna have a guy named uh, Mustafa Design DZ, who's uh, been a who's a, a metal uh, metal band uh, album cover guy doing one of the covers. And if you uh, if you go to the Kickstarter and you take a look at the icon there, that's Mustafa's work. And then we're going to have an, another guy named Chris who uh, creates. Uh, who creates. He also he's also a, like a metal and industrial band album cover designer. Uh, he uh, publishes uh, his stuff under the name The Iron Parasite. He's going to be doing another one. And throughout the campaign, we're going to be uh, debuting all these covers. So it'll be Mustafa's first. I think uh, Chris The Iron Parasite stuff is going to be second. And then I think uh, Justin's is going to be third. I mean, we might. You know, we, we might, depending on who finishes first, we'll be uh, uh, playing with that. But yeah, I want people to have like three different, three different covers. I think for, especially for a Kickstarter project, yeah. you know, as, as, as much as, uh, as uh, you know, uh, uh, you'd like there to be a bit of diversity for people who, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they want to get every version of it. Uh, so the, uh, the two uh, metal designers are going to be doing um, very sort of, Dave McKean inspired, like Sandman inspired um, oh, okay. covers, uh, but very um, like photo, like photo bashing kind of stuff. So they're taking photos, but they're at the, they're like manipulating them in various ways. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Justin's going to be doing more traditional pen and ink art, or, or yeah, digital pen, digital pen and ink art. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll I'll probably add in a picture of it, but uh, to explain this uh, this picture you're talking about, it's it's really cool because it's almost like somebody's face is being pulled off but the back part that it's being pulled from looks very like robotic and it has yep. like almost like digital stretch marks between the two and um it, it looks very painful too that <laughs> <sighs> yeah so <laughs> it's yeah it's that, that and that kind of like it so that ties in with the the monsters of the series which are the mm -hmm. uh we've been calling them techs or tech ghosts or things like that and they are sort of like these man machine hybrids they're sort of somewhere in between like the borg from star trek uh, tetsuo the iron man from the old uh japanese uh sci-fi movie 
and like the Cenobites from Hellraiser. They are uh, in some cases, in some cases, soldiers, in some cases, regular people that have uh, that have been in kind of like uh, converted over into these things uh, that are neither human, they're uh, neither human nor machine. And they are, uh, you know, some of them have memories of their old life, some of them don't. And uh, the one thing that they want is to uh, replicate, to make more of themselves. So, you know, they are either, uh, they're either bringing, taking people and making machines out of them, or they're taking machines and making people out of them. They're adding, you know, uh, so they're adding flesh to machinery, and it's a it's a horrible thing. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah but that's sort like of a, a very painful process. <laughs> yeah, and that's uh, that's what I'm trying to get for uh, trying to, uh, or at least I'm kind of asking the artist to bring forward with what we're doing there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like I like I said, I mean, this looks like I don't know. It looks it looks like the bo the body horror. You've got uh tech elements to it so like and then it looks like a very human face though so yep. um the art so far looks like it's very much bringing and evoking what you're describing here um yep. so that, that definitely makes me excited to see uh what the inside of the book's going to look like because you know if they're already capturing that in the cover i can only imagine once the story unfolds and we start to learn more about this world what that's going to entail and uh how well that comes through the art itself you yep. know yeah, and uh, Justin and Todd have been doing amazing job. Like because you know, you know, in, in in a horror story, they can't all be monsters. Like you know, you have mm -hmm. to have these human elements. You have to have people. You have to care about the people. And they've been doing such a great job of like um, sort of like taking my ideas of who these people are and like creating them in a visual sense, and then like bringing them to life and bringing them, giving them you know, character, you know, some of which I described and then some of which they're just like pulling from their own imaginations. It's been really, really cool to see, like, yeah. you know, they just seeing interpretations of my ideas showing up on page through somebody else. It's so like the collaboration process for this has been so cool. Really, really yeah. cool. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's something I hear all the time, you know, is because it's a collaborative effort. Um, you know, a lot of times the writer tends to come up with this idea and this concept and then they're explaining this to an artist who is then taking that and turning that into something and sending it back, you know, and that seems to be the most exciting part, especially as the writer is like getting your, your tangible idea back and saying like, okay, now this is, you know, real for me and it can be real for other people at this point, you know? Yeah. You know, and uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, they, some, you know, sometimes those, you know, sometimes, you know, you work with artists, they don't get it. Sometimes you, you work with artists and they have a different interpretation of how a thing should go than like you, you were, you, you wrote on a page or something like that. And I've, I've had none of that experience here. It's always been like, if, if like an art, in a, in a case where like, if Justin's made a change, it's been like, I've taken a look and it's like, Oh, I get why you did that. And that's a great idea. Yeah. You know, it's, it's been fantastic to, to have that happen. And, you know, mm -hmm. you know, as like a writer, sometimes, you know, in, you know, sometimes like you do have to like cover up for something like if an artist has a different idea of how a scene should go, you have to change stuff. Like you have to, mm -hmm. think, one of the things that I really like about like lettering mine and stuff is like, I can change the dialogue to, you know, mm -hmm. because if they have a different way, like a character is acting or something like that, I can, uh, you know, I can, yeah, you know, I can change it if uh, they, they were they were speaking sarcastically or something, and if they don't have that face in the panel, yeah, I like being able to letter because I can change. You know, I can make them not look, you know, not speak so cynically. While you know, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's uh, this, that's something this, that I've always noticed is like um, when you have an artist that can portray like facial expression, like an artist that can like really act with the characters, you tend to find like there's very little dialogue. And whenever I talk to those kinds of writers and stuff, they're like, Oh yeah. Whenever I wrote the script, like they were saying so many things. And then whenever I looked at, it, I was like, Oh no, this character is portraying half of the words I'm saying, you know? And so like you can cut it down and uh, vice versa, you know, you get like a, a poor artist or an artist that doesn't quite match your, your level of mm -hmm. vision, you know, and then you end up having to like write much more dialogue to really explain things more, you know? Yeah. And I think it's like, it can go, uh, it can go so many different ways and it's, it's not always like they're a poor artist or they don't mm -hmm. get what you're trying to do. It's um, they're 
you know, in, in a lot of ways, I think it's kind of like you're um, as like a, a creator, as a writer, you know, maybe it, like in a lot of cases, especially me, you know, I'm fairly new to the game, even though, you know, I've been doing this for a couple of years now, you know, I'm if I'm not describing something properly, that is always going to come come across in the art. Like you know, mm -hmm. an, an, an an artist can only paper over so many of your cracks. Mm -hmm. um, so in in cases you know in cases like that, like I've had to you know I've been in situations with previous stories that I've written that like I've had yeah. to like write more dialogue to make sure mm -hmm. that like a, a thing is coming across or like I've had to like add, you know, I've never had, like, I didn't have narration and I added in narration because, you know, it wasn't, things weren't clear. Mm -hmm. um, this is actually not one of those experiences. If, you know, if anything else, it's like what you were saying before, I've, I've been able to remove things because I think, yeah. uh, you know, the, the artists have, the artists have gotten it better than I thought that, you know, anybody could. And it's, mm -hmm. it's been, it's been great. It's been really, really great. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, and that's the other thing too, is you have to kind of like tailor to your artist. You know, if you, if you have an artist that's like really good at action scenes, well, when you write an action scene, you can be like, okay, these two pages, they need to like get from here to here and just let them fill in everything. And it'll work. Whereas like maybe in slower scenes, they're not as strong and you got to explain that mm -hmm. more. And sometimes it's the other way, you know, like you really got to like write out all your action because that's not their strength. But then slower scenes you'd be like okay he's expressing this emotion and they can just like boom 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 nail it for you you know and yeah. so you like have to tailor your collaboration to the strengths and weaknesses of each element of that team you know because everybody's yeah. a little bit different yeah and every time that you do it you learn more about your own strengths and weaknesses and then mm -hmm. you learn a little bit more about like how your how your storytelling um can be improved or like you learn more about the things that you do that are actually like these are the things I should be doing more of because this is yeah. what I'm, this is, this, this, you, you start of, you start learning, like, this is what I bring to the table. This is my strength as a creator. And it's been, uh, it's been, it, you know, this is I, again, like, this is just a, uh, an, another experience of kind of like learning, you know, what could I be doing better? What could, you know, what, what can I be doing better as a, both a creator and a creative partner? It's yeah. Awesome. And um, I guess my last real big question or topic for you is um, what else have you done? Is there anything that we can look into uh, social media and stuff? Anything that any other works you want to show off or send yeah. us towards? So I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and I'll once again, point down at my, <laughs> <laughs> my Twitter here. Uh, that's tends to be my like uh, main conduit to the world. It's, it's an easy, it's an easy app to post on. Um, I also have a website, which is uh, the same thing. It's ritual83 without the underscore dot RIP uh, because I am a big horror nerd. So I got the <laughs> dot RIP domain. <laughs> That's awesome. I never thought about using that as an extension. Yeah. Um, so uh, I got that. Um, you can. Uh, so if uh, if you, you know, if uh, you like the idea of my cyberpunk stuff and you want to check out, uh, but you want to check out more of my like plain horror stuff. Um, check out, uh, I have a, a book up on Comixology. Uh, I understand at some point before the end of the year, it's going to be going on one of their indie sales. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. But it's called Keep Six, um, which is, it's uh, about six short stories. They're all interconnected with a, an overarching um, overarching uh, narrative. And it's kind of in the vein of like Creepshow or uh, the little Tales from the Crypt stuff. It's not really... Like uh, like twisty like tales from the crypt, but it's uh, short stories that are all inter inter interconnected and uh, that all kind of um, work as a whole. Uh, it also has uh, some pro stuff attached to it, um, and then um, I will be uh, probably after after obsolete or in between obsolete volumes, I'll be doing more in that world because I kind of um, I've kind of built that up as being kind of an overarching uh, world that I can write more stories inside of. Uh, in addition to that, if you're into horror short stories, I have a I have one that just came out in a novel, sorry, not a novel, uh, in a, an anthology that came out from a company called uh, Eerie River Publishing, uh, and it's called It Calls from the Sky, uh, and it's basically a whole series of horror stories, uh, all centered around the sky. Things from any, anything from like storms to airplanes to alien invasions to just if you, there's a horror story, like if there's a horror idea that can be connected to the sky, there's a story about it. And 
uh, in the book. Uh, mine uh, kind of centers around a, uh, a website that tracks uh, uh, extraterrestrial conspiracy theories kind of based around um, the old coast to coast uh, radio station radio shows that they used to do um, and art bell and people like that um, but yeah. it's basically um, it's 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 a uh, people who hear about conspiracy theories trying to track down where they came from and finding out perhaps they weren't so conspiracy after all and then um, in addition to that, obviously, I have Obsolete coming out on Kickstarter, uh, Kickstarter now, um, and uh, yeah, that's basically uh, that's basically the the uh, the the, the, uh, the rigmarole. <laughs> that's awesome, it. yeah, yeah.